Welcome to the Bacchus Showcase. The subject this time is the Army of Sweden in the Great Northern War, 1700 to 1721. The aim of this series of short videos is to take examples of figures from our ranges and view them in greater depth than is possible on our website. We also provide a, a quick view of what is available in terms of rules for the armies and finish off with a, a speedy guide to painting and presenting Finnish units. We do have a planned schedule of subjects for future episodes, but if you would like us to cover one of your favourites, please let us know via the comment section or by email or through Facebook. The Great Northern War was fought at the same time as the more well-known Spanish Succession War, but it lasted longer from 1700 until 1721 and had far longer lasting and vastly more important end results. There are many articles and books on the period, but in brief, in 1700 the newly crowned teenage king of Sweden, Charles XII, ruled over a Baltic empire facing war on three fronts. The perennial enemy from across the Sound, Denmark, the ambitious would-be king of Poland, Augustus of Saxony, and most ominously, the energetic Tsar Peter of Russia. In a series of devastating campaigns, the small Swedish army confounded the odds, and starting at Narva in 1700, in battle after battle, defeated every opponent, no matter what the odds. Denmark was knocked out of the war in 1700, and Saxony neutralised by 1707. Charles then set out to invade Russia and settle things with Peter once and for all. However, cold, hunger and Russian scorched earth tactics all combined to thwart his plans. And when he finally did bring the Russian army to battle at Poltava in 1709, his much depleted army was soundly defeated. This marked the long decline in Swedish fortunes as Charles went into exile in Turkey for the next few years and Peter's forces had a free hand in conquering Swedish possessions in the Baltic coast and Finland. Charles returned to rally his troops, but he was killed in Norway in 1719. The war continued until 1721, but an exhausted Sweden sued for peace. The Baltic Empire was gone, as was Sweden's position as a great power, and the foundations of the modern Russian state had been laid. The Great Northern War is a period that has long held a fascination for me ever since I studied it at school for my A-levels. And when I set out to create my first GNW army, information was scarce. I even wrote a couple of articles for a war games magazine illustrating my researchers to share with others. There were no complete, dedicated or indeed accurate figure ranges for the period available, and so when I started Bacchus, this was one of my very first subjects. Now since that time, interest in the period has grown immensely and it now is really very well covered by some wonderful publications and miniatures in all scales. The models that you're about to see are very recent re-sculpts of that earlier range. They are beautifully designed and the charging models capture the essence of the offensive tactics that marked the Swedish army of the period. GNS1 and GNS6 Infantry in hat, advancing and charging. Swedish tactics for both foot and horse were based around the offensive use of edged weapons. The foot would advance on the enemy, deliver a volley with half of its strength, advance further, fire again, and then follow this up with a full-scale charge at the enemy. This fall-on tactic could be devastating and proved itself time and time again. However, it was fragile in that it could meet its match against well-defended opponents and it left little room for failure. GNS2 and GNS7 Pikemen advancing and charging At a time when all of the modern armies were abandoning the pike, the Swedes retained them in their native regiments, constituting one-third of an infantry battalion. These fearsome weapons were meant to be used offensively as the Swedish foot unleashed an all-out charge on those unfortunate enough to be stood in their way. However, the latter years of the war saw the Swedes abandoning the pike in favour of all musket-armed units. G 
GNS3 and GNS4. Infantry are pike when advancing, wearing carpus. As Swedish soldiers campaigned in chillier climes than their contemporaries in Western Europe, they often wore a more practical headgear than the ubiquitous hat. The carpus was a wool cap with flaps at the side and back that could fall down to cover the ears and neck, therefore offering great protection in inclement weather. Derived from a peasant origin, the military version was generally blue, lined with a facing colour that showed when the flaps were folded back on the head. GNS6 Grenadiers Every battalion had a company of grenadiers. While there is some debate on the subject, it would seem that in the native Swedish regiments, grenadiers did not wear distinctive headgear. However, this practice did not extend to the enlisted regiments recruited from outside Sweden and Finland, as all of our surviving examples come from such units. Strangely enough, the foot guard grenadiers definitely retained their hats, even though they were technically an enlisted unit. GNS 11 Swedish Horse The Swedish mounted arm acquired a well-deserved and fearsome reputation. At a time when most so-called charges were conducted at just a brisk trot, Swedish cavalry charged at the gallop. They adopted a unique squadron formation with a cornet at the tip of a shallow wedge. The rest of the troopers formed leg behind leg to either side of him. These arrowheads swept all before them in the early years of the war. All the Swedish horse regiments were raised from Swedish nationals. GNS 13 and GNS 14 Dragoons in hat and carpus. Now at a time when, in all other armies, Dragoons were only just transitioning from a mounted infantry to a, a more cavalry role, the Swedish Dragoons were used tactically as battle line horse, and Swedish horse at that. They used the same wedge tactics and were equally successful. The Dragoon regiments were all enlisted, which meant that they drew in recruits from the Baltic provinces, and especially from Germany. GNS 15 Swedish generals. Drawn from the upper echelons of Swedish society, the general officers were true warlords, often making personal fortunes from the results of their conquests and campaigns. This, however, does not mean that they were incompetent, quite the reverse. Many had learned their trade in the armies of various nations, especially the Dutch forces, and they were professional soldiers of the highest calibre. Most war games rules treat the Great North War as a subset, or at best an adjunct, to the War of Spanish Succession, thus losing much of the distinctiveness in terms of tactics, style of war and sheer diversity of protagonists that set the period apart. One of the exceptions to this is our very own Polymos Great North War rule set, and as you would expect with a dedicated set, they bring out the aspects of the campaigns and the armies that really give a period feel to the games. As with all of the rules in the Polymos series, there is a set of comprehensive army guides incorporating an ingenious random army generation system. All of this is rounded out with a description of the armies of the participants, detailing their strengths and their weaknesses. We support our rules with army and booster packs designed for army and unit compositions recommended in the rules, and a range of comprehensive, accurate flag sheets. Now for anyone interested in starting this most fascinating of Wargames periods, our box set offers great value for money and includes two complete armies, rules, painting guides, flag sheets, bases and scenic items. Twilight of the Sun King are a set offering play in the wider period of the early 18th century and are not specifically a Great North War set. However, they do follow the same basing regime as a Polymos set, and importantly, written by Nick Dorrell, who also penned the Polymos rules. 
Nick is massively knowledgeable about this period, and he applies that to all of his writings. We know that for many newcomers to Six Mill, the prospect of painting the figures can seem daunting. However, as any experienced Six Mill gamer will tell you, it really is far simpler than you think. Basic painting techniques will be covered fully in other videos in this channel, but the following example should give you an idea of how quick and simple a process this really is. The subject this time will be Swedish infantry and hat. And as with all my painting examples, we start from a black undercoat. The first stage is to paint the coats blue. This does not have to be a particularly accurate or even coverage. Areas of black undercoat left uncovered serve to shade and define the finished figures. The next stage is to paint the bandolier strap, belt and scabbard, and I'm using a bush shade here. Don't worry if the line seems incredibly thin, it really is no worse than painting piping on a 28mm figure, and as the straps are raised, it really is very easy. The same buff is used to catch the waistcoat, where it peers, peeks out from the turnbacks just below waist level. And speaking of turnbacks, these come next as they and the cuffs get a quick splash of yellow. The figures start to take shape as we add brown on the musket stock and give all the lads brown hair. As we near the end, the figure starts to come to life with flesh appearing on the hands and face. And using black, the hats, cartridge box and hair bags are tidied up. The bread bags and straps are picked out in white and the tricorn lace added. Now this is the bit that most people find trickiest, but really, once you get the hang of it, it's surprisingly quick and easy to do. The final colour is grey. Uh, I've stopped using silver for musket barrels, etc. And instead I just use a light grey. It sounds crazy, but it works really nicely, and I now prefer it rather than use metallic paints. With eight steps, this paint job is just a little bit more involved than the earlier ones in the series but it's nonetheless straightforward and quick. A little more care could be taken, a few highlights thrown in, but to be honest that would really be just wasted effort. This completed unit took just 40 minutes to paint from beginning to end. So to finish off, one of the requests that we've had is to show some of the models and figures in action. And to this end I will close with some pictures of a view of a Great North War game in progress. And in this case, it's Swedes versus Saxons. Now, these are all figures from our original range, as I haven't had the chance to upgrade my armies to the new castings yet. But I hope you'll agree that they're no worse for all that. The first image is of both armies deployed and about to get stuck in. You'll see the Swedish cavalry in there, to be a wedge formation on both flanks, and the Swedish infantry making great advances in the centre. Next we have a closer look at the Swedish foot, typically outnumbered by the Saxons, and with one third of each battalion carrying their pike. And here we have a close up of the Swedish cavalry, about to sweep all before them, or so they expect. Really would you like to be one of the guys in red coats facing them right now? And finally we have a, a beauty shot really. And in this case, we concentrate more on the Saxons in the background than the Swedes. Uh, some people think that you can't get a, a nice visual impact with the small figures. Well, I would hope that this photograph would put that lie to rest. And a final thought for you for today. The total cost of the entire Swedish army shown here will buy you less than one and a half infantry battalions or cavalry regiments in 28mm figures. That's a whole army for the cost of less than two big war games units. That's really worth thinking about. Enjoy. <laughs>